She can still hear me and see me. <laughs> so we will start. This is Ecumenism Part Two. <laughs> thank you, Rivera, and thank you again for being with us. Okay. Yeah. Maybe uh, a quick review of what we said last week may help. Uh, I know you said you were not here, yeah. but everybody else, I think, was here last week, right? Yeah. Oh, so, uh, um, and you, I think we can get you a copy of what we shared oh, last no, week. Oh, there it is. Last week, we'll she's always right ready. Out of it. Yeah. Get on it. It's like, so, uh, we talk about the, the work, the formation and the work of the World Council of Churches, mm -hmm. and also of the work of uh, Catholic Church, uh, the Second Vatican Council, because these two events, uh, these two organizations uh, have contributed much to what we call the new ecumenical era. So, of course, the World Council of Churches was originally founded by exclusively Protestant denominations, but eventually other evangelical churches and the Orthodox churches are joined. Not yet the Catholic Church, but they are always observe, observers and collaborators in projects, but they are not full members. Uh, eventually, the World Council of Churches also accepted organizations, like church-related organizations, not just churches as members. So it has grown to more than 300 uh, member churches and organizations to this day. And they have produced a number of resources for study. The most important of them all, and something that I did not <laughs> include in last week, uh, a handout, is the document from 1982, Baptism, Eucharist, and Ministry, 1982, or the Lima document, like in Lima, Peru, that was the site of the assembly in 82. And it's a magnificent document because it summarizes uh, what churches say about precisely baptism, their understanding, the nature of baptism, how they practice, etc., the nature of Eucharist, communion, their understanding, how they practice it, and ministry, orders of ministry, uh, who teaches, who preaches, who presides at the table in your Christian community, right? Mm -hmm. So to this day, it's an important document of a study, of course, uh, because there are more churches that have joined and organizations since then. It made this, we made these some updates, right? But it's still a very important doctrinal uh, conversation among churches who have been collaborating with one another in many projects for justice and peace and service, etc. So one of the last things we were saying last week was we turned to the ELCA and we didn't go over these in detail, but it is there in the handout for last week at the bottom of the first page you have what the ELCA says about ecumenical relationships and getting into full communion agreements. For example, the emphasis is on common confessing of the Christian faith. And see, that's number one, because for the reformers, confessing Christ was like the number one thing. The whole purpose of Christian community and church, or the main purpose of the whole, the main purpose is to confess Christ uh, in, in what we teach, in what we preach, in what we do, in how we pray, in how we serve others, that through all of these beliefs and activities, we confess Christ, because Christ is the Lord of the world, individually and communally. So the LCA says, uh, do you confess Christ? And how do you confess Christ? Where do you see your confessing of Christ? So that's, and also the mutual recognition of baptism. And I said that last week that 
the document, the report on the way, declaration on the way from 2015 doesn't include a section on baptism because there's a lot of agreement with Catholics on the meaning and the practice of baptism. So it's not included. And again, the LCS says mutual recognition of our baptisms is is very important, you know, meaning the validity of the baptism as practiced in the Episcopal Church or Presbyterian, you name it, right? Uh, mutual recognition and availability of ordained ministers to the service of all, etc. So who gets ordained? And full communion agreements include what exchange of table and pulpit, meaning that the Presbyterian minister can come to this place and preside at the table and vice versa, the Lutheran at the Presbyterian church or the uh, disciples of Christ. No, disciples of Christ. We are in the conversation. We are not in, <laughs> yet in full agreement. I'm ahead of myself. Mm -hmm. uh, but we were the Mennonites mm -hmm. and the Me United Methodists. We have full communion agreements. Right. But also, uh, mm -hmm. pulpit exchange, of course, has to do with uh, who is authorized or allowed to preach. But of course, we know that we have been inviting preachers, even preachers from uh, denomination with who we don't have yet a full <laughs> communion agreement. We invite, invite, say, uh, a Baptist pastor or a Pentecostal, say, for the sake of the argument, to, to yeah, or Catholic priest, and we don't have a full communion agreement. So we have been doing that, <laughs> right? But the point of uh, exchange of pulpit and table is that a pastor from one of the full communion denominations can be called to be the pastor of this congregation and a Lutheran into another denomination. So I know of Mennonite pastors who are serving Lutheran congregations right now. I know a lot, at least three of them, and that's just in the Northeastern mm. Pennsylvania Synod area, since they have a lot of <laughs> pastors. Uh, I know of Lutheran who have served Episcopal churches and vice versa. Yep, I know so, that. And that's what it means. This full communion agreements open the door to this exchange of ministries, etc. So uh, I put it in writing for you to uh, go back and think more about it. We have full communion agreements with three reformed churches. Reformed and Lutherans are cousins, or you know, they grew up together. <laughs> But then they started fighting at some point. <laughs> but the 17th century, they couldn't live together any longer. Anyway, but re the agreement with Reformed churches include Presbyterian Church in the USA, that one. There are other Presbyterian, yeah. Orthodox Presbyterian, etc. Cumberland and whatever. Reformed Church in America and United Church of Christ. With those three, we have one agreement. Uh, it's called Formula of Agreement 1997. We have agreement with the Episcopal Church. Uh, the agreement is called Call to Common Mission. With the Moravian Church, uh, the two provinces, main provinces, northern and southern provinces, and United Methodist Church, but we have currently dialogue with African Methodist Episcopal, African Methodist Episcopal Zion, Disciples of Christ, Mennonite, the Mennonite Church in the USA, Orthodox Church, and of course, the longest lasting ecumenical theological dialogue to these days with Roman Catholics. It began in 1965. So it's going now into 58, almost 59 years. Jack Ruman was involved with that? He was involved right. in the in early ones. Yeah. And Many other people, like Tim Wengard, he oh, was yeah. very much involved right. in the one on teaching ministry. Oh. That last now, this dialogue may last at, at the beginning, it was like a year, and then, of course, it was like two or three. And uh -huh. the teaching ministry, there were some uh hiatuses there, gaps there, but it went on for all, like for nine or ten years. And of course, the pandemic didn't help, 
And at the end, the final report <coughs> was written and ready for publication in 2022, but it came out just in November of 2023 as a book, right? Mm -hmm. So it's available, not yet for free. <laughs> no electronic copy for free yet, but of others you can find in the ELCA webpage and also the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops webpage. Uh, so, Declaration on the Way was put together to celebrate 50 years of Lutheran Catholic dialogue from 1965 to 2015, right? And what I brought today for you is precisely <clears throat> the context and the contents of the Declaration of the Way. I mean, what highlights, let me say. And what brings us to the current dialogue, which is the 13th round of conversations with the Roman Catholic Church, and only God knows for how long this is gonna go. It's been now like a year and a half. And I remember the first meeting I said, so is, are we gonna do this for like for two years? And they laughed <laughs> and I said, okay, you're talking about like four to five and someone said, with luck. <laughs> so I said, okay, I, I should be prepared to die here. <laughs> I have a question. Uh, Is, uh, Linda, 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 do you have a question? question? Yeah. Like, well, how often do you meet and for how long? Do you like get together for a, like a whole week and meet or do you meet once a month or how do you, how do you get together? So the idea thus far is once a year we meet for like three to four days. Uh, and we have done that twice. And then in between there, there are one or two meetings online. So there will be a meeting now, a fourth meeting in mid-March and another meeting in mid-April. And for these meetings, two members, one from each side, are commissioned with writing a paper, a presentation on a specific topic. In mid-March, the discussion will be about Episcope, the Ministry of Oversight of the Ministry of Bishops in the New Testament writings. So it's the biblical understanding. Mm -hmm. So there are two people, one from each side, the Lutheran and the Catholic, speaking about it. And they already gave us like a, a some preliminary insights or notes is fascinating because uh, what's called Episcope oversight from which the word Episcopal comes, right? Uh, in the New Testament writings themselves, it's not one definition or understanding. And of course the verb, you know, to supervise, to do oversight, it's to exercise authority or care for a community is used differently in different New Testament writings to the point that New Testament scholars divide between early understandings of episcope oversight, like in Pauline uh, letters, Paul's letters, the, the so-called early Paul, letters of Paul. And then there are these later <laughs> letters, like in First and Second Timothy and Titus, where the understanding of Episcopate of the bishop's role has already evolved and changed. And we know that originally bishops were, to put it this way, the original leader of a congregation, of a local congregation, the one called to preside at the table and presbyters, what we call pastors, were there as assistants. But eventually bishops became overseers for a number of communities spread throughout a region. And of course, that's just the New Testament. 
imagine then developments beyond the New Testament writings, mm -hmm. say two, three, four, five centuries more of Christian history. Mm -hmm. And the picture is very complex about how bishops have been understood and where we find ourselves today. So just to uh, give you an example. So basically we're talking about like three meetings a year, but one meeting in person for three to four days. The last one in person, the first one was in Baltimore, St. Mary's University and Seminary, a uh, beautiful place. Mm -hmm. But the last one in uh, October, last October, was in St. John's Abbey, which is part of St. John's University in nowhere, Minnesota. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, in central uh, Minnesota. Uh, Collegeville and surrounding areas. I believe I forget. In the summer. Uh, no, it was October. It was uh, early, early fall, although they said... Uh, fall here is really two weeks, they told me. Two and weeks. it was just the, the first days of fall, like the first two or three days. And, he, and they said, in two weeks, there won't be any leaf left. Wow. <laughs> I was like, oh my God. Anyway, thank no, goodness. Yeah, no, on time right. and get out, you know, like. Uh, so, and that was beautiful setting. I mean, it was yeah. extraordinary because we were invited to join Benedictine monks for the Daily prayers, morning, noontime, evening, at the end of the day, and the Benedictine monks. Again, there has always been Catholics who are so open that they, if you go to, they invite you to a communion and you go, they will give you communion. And Benedictine monks, they are, they are of the time. Mm -hmm. They said, you can come. But of course, we are in the dialogue and we have as an aim to reach full communion, not just for a small group of people, but for the whole of the churches, right? So of course, we are invited, we're thankful, but as a group, we don't commune, of course, because we have to just respect the process, to put it that way. Uh, but again, they, he, there is a place, St. John's Abbey, where these monks and their leaders are very open to you go, you get communion with us, you know. Do you get homework between to look into things? Uh, so yeah. you're ready? Do, do, do they send you stuff to say, for the next meeting, we're going to discuss the, these are things you should read? Or There are some papers that are shared in advance of the meeting. But also, uh, for the first meeting, they said there are two of the reports that have been published before. Like the one, the church as koinonia of salvation. So it's a book and say, read it. If you haven't, do it. And I had not. So, and it's amazing book. And again, remember, ultimately is the differences between Lutherans and Catholics, despite all the agreements in, in a number of areas. The main difference has okay. to do with the understanding of the church. And of course, when you speak about what is the church and what is the nature of the church, it touches upon the church's orders of ministry. Why do you have bishops? Why do you ordain bishops? Why do you think the bishop represents the fullness of ordination? While Lutherans are saying, well, that fullness of ordination is already represented or incarnated in each one of the pastors. Mm -hmm. So why do you say that? And also your understanding of church shapes understanding of what communion is. And I, beginning with, actually, we have a lot of agreement about the presence of Christ in communion. On that, we have a lot of agreement. But we don't, don't necessarily don't believe that it's in the bread, though. That in the elements, Christ is truly given to us. Well, that's a, 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 a simplification because as Luther, or we, I won't say Lutheran because 
a lot of Lutherans don't know that Luther insisted that the emphasis is in the eating and the drink, not so much in the bread and the wine, but in the act of eating the body of Christ and drinking the blood of Christ. Uh, but Catholics are fine with that too. Oh. But for them, communion is more, is yes, it's primarily, uh, again, we agree, full participation of Christ. You receive Christ for, as a benefit. It does something for you. Well, again, how many Lutherans actually believe that coming to communion actually is beneficial? But you answer the question. Uh, but for then, besides, I know, please, besides the real communion with Christ and the benefits of communion, and that's why, remember, they offer communion how many times? Every day. <laughs> So it's beneficial, it's communion. But it also means that the Catholic communes after Christ, of course, with the bishop and all the way to the Pope. So you are in communion with them. And we Lutherans, we do not reject that when you commune, you, you commune with one another and you're in communion with the pastor and you're in communion with our bishop. But for them, it really means that you ought to be in good standing with the church. And, and, and I myself uh, uh, sometimes thing that a few Lutheran leaders, pastors or lay leaders, so I don't think they get the idea yet of being in communion with one another, being in communion with not just the local pastors, with pastors of the church and in communion with the bishop of the synod, which means that we should seek opportunities to practice that communion and community with one another beyond the congregation. And I'm just saying that I don't expect any controversies now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no, it's uh, the Catholics keeps telling us, you know, it's like, uh, do you take this seriously? Like you belong to a greater whole, that your congregation belongs to a regional church, that your regional church belongs to a national church, that your national church, oh wait, the, your national church belongs to a worldwide, mm -hmm. well, a worldwide organization, Lutheran World Federation, yeah. But we don't call Lutheran World Federation a church. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So there is a difference. Mm -hmm. uh, the Catholic can say, my church, meaning my local congregation, is part of the church, diocesan church. It's a church. And the diocesan church is part of the national church. And the national church is part of our worldwide global church yeah. catholic church you know so and there's a difference in understanding of what is church and, and at what levels and again it's communion is community if you really think you are in communion with your pastor other ministers in your area with the bishop and we have a presiding bishop then we pray for them, we seek opportunities for community because the Catholic understanding is that everybody's needed. I mean, yeah. Catholic, Catholic means that you cannot dispense with anybody. Otherwise, you're, you're, you're denying the church. The church is, Catholic means a whole made out of many, many parts 
and every part is needed. You cannot deny any of its parts. That's why for Catholics, being in communion and community and belonging matters a lot. And one of the worst things that can happen to anyone is what? To be excommunicated or for a bishop or a pastor to be removed and eventually defrog or it's, it's like we have cut the ties with you. You're not in communion any longer. You don't belong. Uh, and of course, they don't do that lightly. They don't take that lightly because you are cutting someone from the body of Christ. Uh, so again, I don't mean to say that we don't take it seriously, but there is a difference in the understanding of how dependent we are on one another. By that it means individuals within the congregation, congregation from congregation, congregation to synod, synod to synod, to the national level. And, and again, Lutheran World Federation is not a church, but is a tool and, and an instrument for bringing many national Lutheran churches together and make possible that they can actually commune with one another. Part of the scandal is that although a great majority of Lutheran churches around the world see themselves in communion with one another, not every single Lutheran church thinks so. Yeah. Hmm? That's good. I mean, I, I'm glad we're not in communion with the uh, uh, Wisconsin Synod. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but yeah. not because we reject it. It's, They've rejected us, and we're yeah, not yeah. a true church in the eyes of Rome either. But I think the yeah. Roman Catholic Church understanding is way too small. Mm -hmm. Because when I talk, when I pray for the Christian Church on Earth, mm -hmm. the, the, the Church Catholic. Mm -hmm. Part of that is the Roman Catholic Church. Yes. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. it's also the Wisconsin Synod. Yeah. 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 And they, in since Vatican II, Catholic ecclesiology have been also pushing some of the boundaries. I mean, they have many ecumenical theologians. Uh, uh, for uh, it, I was reading the, the main document, I mean, not the only one, but the main document for Catholic ecclesiology. Uh, teaching about the church is one of the Vatican II uh, documents, Constitution on the Church. There's more than one document, but that's the, the, the big one, Constitution on the Church. And in the past, they had denied that the Church of Christ was in other right. so-called churches. I mean, they, for them it was so-called church. But since the Constitution of the Church, Vatican II, they changed the language. And the language is interesting. It says that they recognize that the Church of Christ subsists in other uh, Christian communities. Mm -hmm. For what does that mean? <laughs> that just subsists. It's like, it's still there. <laughs> it might not be full, but it's there. It could be better, probably. Yeah. But it subsists. And that's quite a recognition because that's remember, that's just so from 1965 oh, on God. that there is such a. Now, of course, the movement of theologians pushing for that understanding precedes two or three decades. Yeah. Uh, uh, many of those French and German pushing for a different understanding, et cetera. Uh, theologians. So yes, yeah, subsist. So, and that's something. <laughs> is it? Is this just working with the American Catholic Church? The uh -huh. well, the dialogue, the the one I'm, I'm naming, the thirteen round is the USA. Uh, internationally, there is a dialogue also going on uh, with member between member churches of the Lutheran World Federation and the Catholic Church, the Secretariat for Christian Unity or Ecumenical Relationship, something, you know, yeah, for Christian <laughs> Unity. Uh, now, the reports that are produced in this context are shared 
with the Lutheran World Federation and the Catholic and the Vatican. So they have copy of all of these. So the Declaration on the Way, as far as I know, has been applauded as a very good document that they are also using. Uh, <clears throat> now, in, <laughs> in the first meeting, when I asked about the document, they said, well, they 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 do applaud what uh, Lutherans and Catholics are doing in the USA, but German theologians on both sides always think that we do too little. <laughs> They're too short. The, the books are too short. <laughs> uh. <laughs> are too brief. You know, like you know, we don't go into enough detail. Exactly. Yeah, okay. These people don't go into enough detail. <laughs> you know, but that's yeah, all you know, prejudice. <laughs> anyway, uh, does that does that help? Now the. In 1999, the uh, Catholic Church and the Lutheran World Federation, um, its members, signed the uh, declaration, the, the agreement on justification by faith, uh, 1999. And that's really a major uh, contribution because this is now the international uh, dialogue that produced this agreement on justification and signed by the Vatican. And then of course there was a service and the, um, the Pope went there. I mean, the, the Pope at the time uh, and representative. And, uh, then in 2016, now Pope Francis, uh, they went because of the celebration, 500 years of the Reformation in 2017. Yeah. So 1517 to 2017. In 2016, they did a service and Pope Francis was there and the Lutheran World Federation was represented primarily, not just by one of the, uh, the Archbishop of Uppsala, I think, in Sweden. Yeah, it was a Lund. Uh, yeah, it was, a, yeah. There's beautiful pictures about that. So, where was it? Where? In London, Sweden. In Sweden. The, yeah. the, the exciting thing was that the bishop sat or the pope sat in the chair in the chancel, and all these children came forward. And you know, when children come forward and the pope's there, they just you know they just walk right past him. <laughs> They're going up to sing, you know, and and did this thing, and it was just it was a wonderful image that um, we could get together and we could behave ourselves. And, and celebrate with music and, yeah. and this. You know, that, and the choice of uh, Pope uh, wasn't in charge. Of an <laughs> yeah. The choice of uh, yeah. our bishop, a Swedish our bishop, a woman. Yeah. It's very telling, huh? Ooh, oh, yeah. 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 But well. also, yes. well, the Church of Sweden is the Lutheran Church, yeah. right? right? And is at least officially is the largest Lutheran body, I mean, in terms of baptized membership. Don't ask the question, but the actual yeah, they can't. go to worship, that's yeah. another story. But in terms of <laughs> baptized membership, still, because the, in, in Germany, the churches are oh, region yeah. now. So it's the, the evangelical church of XY region, another region. All together, there are many uh, big in numbers, but the church of Sweden, Lutheran church is one. Uh, so anyway, so there are several reasons why they chose. And, and also... Church of Sweden, Lutherans in Sweden are very Catholic in many ways, in the liturgy, mm -hmm. in the in the vestments, in the practices. So uh, very very good choice anyway to represent um, mm -hmm. us. Mm -hmm. But again, Raymond, we are not Lutheran work. Now, Lutheran work federation. Interesting. Uh, like at least two decades ago. They changed the language. They call the they call themselves now a communion of churches. The language of communion of churches did not exist before, because Lutheran World Federation is seen as well, uh, basically what a, a big committee, you no know, organization. <laughs> yeah. But more than yeah, I think the last twenty years at least, they adopted the language. At least most of them uh, were in favor of putting themselves. We are a communion of churches, but that still is different from saying we are a church. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't think they'll ever say that. Or, or well, 
ecclesiology, the doctrine of the church evolved through time. Mm -hmm. And Roman Catholics, not just Roman Catholics, Anglicans push us very far, uh, strongly in terms of be more clear about bishops and pastors, different orders of ministry, nature of the church, and so on. It is because of call to common mission, 1999, the Fitzcopper Church. It is because of that agreement that Lutherans then study for, for a number of years to reestablish an order of deacons. And it's done now. Now we have with the the LCA took many positions, associates in ministry, uh, deaconesses. Uh, there was another aims deaconesses. Uh, there was another diaconal ministers and also directors of Christian education, directors of music. Yeah. and created one umbrella. It's called Deacons. Deacons. Okay. Now they are, when they are authorized, when they are accepted, they are called Deacons. Now, then the next big conversation because Anglicans, Episcopalians keep pushing. What about ordination? Because you install them, you consecrate them, you set them apart. You commission, certify. <clears throat> so now the language officially is ordination, but there's a difference to work and service. Deacons are ordained in the ELCA to work and service, not to work and sacrament. So when it comes to word and sacrament, there's still one ordination that pastors and bishops share. It's the same ordination. So there is not a special ordination for bishops as Anglicans, Episcopalians, mm -hmm. Catholics, or todos have. So we're not there yet. Hmm? That's okay. <laughs> we don't need bishops for life. No. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. If they're for life, is part of the of the of the conference it doesn't mean that they will work in life yeah. but actually I, I think we're inviting retired bishops uh to be uh, uh to come to meetings of the conference they're invited that doesn't mean that they can vote yeah. but they're invited like at least to keep a connection that they were bishops and what do we call a retired bishop? We still call him retired bishop. <laughs> and if you're saying to them, you don't say like something like like. Oh, we're still. I mean, are they still called still bishop? Call bishop? They're carrying the title. It's sure. the title. It's out, out of yeah. respect. Out of yeah. respect. Like we still meant. say bishop. Yeah. yeah. I saw actually uh, like uh, two months ago. I went to. Uh, I was in December. The the scene of the uh, a gather a, fa uh, a gathering of families. At the seminary at the at the beginning of December, and I saw Bishop Roy Alquist, oh, wow. who I had not seen in years. So I went and Bishop Alquist, so yeah. good to see you. Yeah. Oh my God! She said, "Sit let's talk," and and it was a wonderful conversation. So and everybody was Bishop Alquist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's right. I just it, it's to, yeah. Uh -huh. He comes to our elders' meetings. We meet here sometimes. I, oh, I, I don't do. Oh, you know. excellent. So anyway, as a, now I, I I don't think that's a, a rule, written rule. It's more like a, a sign no of honor and respect. respect. Yeah. yeah. Bishop Claire. Yeah. It's Claire. I actually yeah, have okay. seen her and I said, oh, Bishop Claire. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I was on the committee to help hire her as a, when she came in as an assistant pastor. Oh. Over at Holy Trinity in Abington. Yeah. And the thing is that even when they are retired, they could they are available in case so, some some of needs an interim bishop. And that like happened in Sierra Pacific. Claire yeah. was the interim bishop for one yeah. year right. yeah. in yeah. California, Northern yeah. California. Right. So they they can, they are available if needed. She went down to Maryland too for to Maryland. 
Yeah, she was down in Maryland before she was out in California. Ah, okay. Yeah. So there you go. Uh, now, uh, if you look at the handout, uh, in the back, second page. Oh my God! Oh, I have to come to back. back. Yes, I'm yeah. so sorry. Yeah. No, no, you're very interesting. Yeah. Let's have a, could we put something together, uh, uh, so that we can go through these? Uh, but look wow. at it. Uh, remember, declaration of the way is divided in three sections: church, ministry, and Eucharist, uh, communion, Lord's yeah. table. And these are just some of the highlights. Uh, it needs work. It needs more uh, further conversations. Uh, so when it comes to the church, see the Luther. There is on the one hand the uh -huh. Lutheran emphasis on the church and the congregation of the faithful, where like the fullness of the church of Christ is represented in every congregation. Uh, it's a local assembly, and it's according to the Lutheran <laughs> confessions that the church is that group of people, that assembly that meets around the world, the word of God and the saints. That is the church. Uh, Catholic emphasis that the church itself is a sacrament of salvation, an instrument of salvation, yeah. meaning belonging to the church matters. Mm -hmm. Outside of the church, you are on your own, so to say. Uh, Yes, it's a community of believers, it's a community of the baptized, but also there is this emphasis that the dios, the community of congregations in a region, they represent the fullness of the church and its Catholicity, mm -hmm. not individual congregations on their own. Uh, they are needed, of course, uh, etc. So, but I think we agree that we cannot be church alone or just by ourselves. But I hope that we believe that, mm -hmm. that we need each other. We need other congregations. We're in communion with other Lutherans. Now, of course, we have full communion agreements. So that is expansive circle because officially we're saying oh, we're in communion with that United Methodist Church down the road. We're in communion with that Episcopal Church, wherever they are here. I don't know where they are here. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and that's what full communion agreements mean. Now, some theologians have called the attention that the most beautiful agreements, the most beautifully written, argued agreements, if the individual congregation and congregant, like people like you, if they have no clue what they are, it's like almost non-existent, so to say. Therefore, they speak a lot about reception, that after all has been said, all the reports have been published, authorized, proved, then what? What's next? It's called reception. Ooh. It's the process through which the information and the agreement filters down to each congregation, pastor, leader, each member of the, of the LCA. Uh, and then they are real, I mean, to understand what, what to be in communion with other Lutherans or Methodists in, in this case, or men on that, uh, uh, Moravian, sorry, uh, Episcopalian, but what it means. Uh, of course, it's the same on the other side. I mean, do they talk about these things? Maybe, I don't know. Uh, so we have a lot of these communal agreements, full communal agreements, uh, but still wonder how many people have heard about it or understand what it means. And also, what have what we have already agreed mm -hmm. with Catholics after more than 50 years. Mm -hmm. There are agreements. Mm -hmm. Declaration on the way, the, the two-thirds of the report of the book are we agree on these things. Mm -hmm. But there's a one-third that says <laughs> we still need work on this. Now they said that many of these are not disagreements, they call it uh 
non-dividing difference. <laughs> Semantics. Because before how, how there wasn't close, enough to divide. How close do they think they have to get to make it an agreement? Because you can have this non-agreement agreement, you know. Wow. The, the thing about the Catholic Church is that they're, they're, it's, a, it's, it's a big church. Right. Mm -hmm. And I was yeah. told that one of the issues in the United States is the conference of bishops. They are like 302 or 304 bishops in the USA, uh, Roman Catholics. If you think they see eye to eye. No. <laughs> no. And apparently, you know, they're in the politics. Uh, Understanding of culture, understanding of church, mm -hmm. whether they like Pope Francis or not. <laughs> There's so many issues mm -hmm. among themselves. Mm -hmm. So that we may come to the most wonderful report and agreement, and it may not be accepted by the Conference of Bishops or not voted on, like Congress does, that you mm -hmm. file it. And forget about it. That is there, and yeah, never do anything about it. <laughs> do they? Does do they require? Do their bishops when they vote on something? Well, yeah, they do have. Do they to... require fifty plus one, or are they... that's a good question. That I don't know. I will have to find out. For something like this, what's the the threshold? I, oh. I don't know. But they do vote on things. Actually, there are news. They voted on some additions to liturgical language just like a couple of months ago. Mm -hmm. And I don't remember what it was, but there's something about liturgical language that they have to vote on. And some of the issue, not the only issue was that there was a priest, or there's a priest somewhere, I don't remember, Wisconsin or something, that for 10 years he was, but he was saying, instead of, I baptize you in the name of the Father, we baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And now they're saying, all the baptisms were... They're not valid. Well, I, saw, not I saw that. Valid. They have to be repeated. So yes. if you yes. thought that the language they have is no. up, the language of the liturgy have to be approved, wow. authorized. Mm. Exactly. That's you are not supposed oh to God. go rogue. That's that is great. I remember reading that. Yeah. So I don't know what's the solution at the end, whether they have to be become, a, or become Lutheran. <laughs> well, that's a good solution. <laughs> but you, you mentioned re receiving. Women were, were ordained in 1970. Mm -hmm. and it was not received by everyone. In church. No. Yeah. But it, on a congregation by congregation basis, yeah. Yeah. When confronted yeah. with a good candidate, um, you know, people made the jump. Yeah. Uh, I guess some churches, some congregations may have left over the ordination. Yeah. I know we, oh, yeah. um, the, Eventually, Orthodox, the, the Orthodox Seminary and got some new enrollments up in, mm -hmm. up in Tuckahoe. Well, eventually, of course. But there are different things. The one thing is uh, a bishop or a group of pastors going ahead and doing it. Because there is a yeah. tradition where if a group of pastors agree to ordain someone, yeah. even if there is no bishop, they do it. But that in the LCA is a no-no because of call to communication. No. All pastors, because of the agreement with the Anglicans, Episcopalians, and also with Methodists, all pastors have to be ordained by a bishop. In the past, before those agreements, a bishop could ask a pastor to go ordain that one. I won't be doing it. Yeah. And that was something. Not any longer. somebody in from Long Island as well. That doesn't mean that your ordination, if you are not ordained by a vision, is invalid. It means that you have been received, your, your ordination has been received into the LCS. Yeah. Yeah. So no need to be ordained again. Although if I were you, I would have yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the exam first. So I have <laughs> some weird ones. <laughs> I'm okay. okay. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. We can have you Until back. we meet again. Yeah. 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 Yes. Thank you. Because then we can go through these yeah. Yeah. and explain what they mean. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. 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 Thank